Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a, another ups, Monday evening of Zen and the Art of. I'm delighted to be here and been uh, working on this uh, project with my co-conspirator, Deborah Briggs, for I think we started March 30th. So we're really just about at the 16-week mark, and um, it's just been a very special adventure. And I'm the executive director of FIU's Miami Beach Urban Studios, and I look forward to these every Monday night. And Deborah, thank you for being a, a wonderful partner. The Betsy in in real life is very close by, and in our in our new Zoom life is even closer in some ways. So um, I like that you're here. You know you're muted. So um, as soon as you're uh, ready to welcome everybody, please unmute. Thank you for telling me I was muted, John, and good evening, everyone. I can always depend on John to whip you me bet. into shape. We're, we're um, it's a pleasure to see everyone here tonight, and um, I always take a moment, I hope it's okay that I do it again, since we have so many people join us week over week. Uh, I wanted to thank our special partners in the community. We're all really committed to working with a broad cross-section <laughs> of the community in the arts and business, and just with everyone who believes, as we do, that the arts connect people. So um, just a shout out to Emboss at FIU and John and his openness to um, partner with the Betsy on this project. The Arts and Business Council Miami. It's just a great, it's a local chapter of a national organization and just helping us to build this audience regionally. And of course, to my Betsy Hotel family and the funding sources that help us with this from there. Um, finally, I wanted to uh, give a special thank you to Pablo Cartaya who has been working with the Betsy for about eight years now on a variety of projects. And his partnership means so much to us. He's helped us to shape the writer's room, which has had over a thousand visiting artists and writers um, over the past, well, since 2012. Um, so tonight we are um, hosting another iteration of uh, Zen and the Art of Writing in America. And our guest tonight is Lee Herrick. So before I pass the baton to Pablo, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Lee. And of course, everybody who knows my family knows that we're not um, embarrassed to say that we have a special place in our heart for poets. We love everyone, but poets are really special to us. Lee is a poet. He's the author of three books of poems. And his poems appear widely also in literary magazines, textbooks, anthologies, etc. cetera. Um, he, uh, he was born in South Korea, and I know he'll talk about that tonight, and was adopted to the United States. He served as the Fresno Poet Laureate from 2015 to 17, and he teaches at Fresno City College and in the MFA program at Sierra Nevada College. So we're really thrilled to have him here. He is kicking off um, a three-part mini-series of our larger series where we feature poets, so it's Lee tonight and Brian Turner next week. And then on our final night, we'll be looking at the work of my dad, actually, Hyam Plexic, who was an American poet. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass the baton here to Pablo. Oh, I forgot, I see John picking up yes, his finger. Yes. I forgot to mention, John, go ahead and fill everyone in. <laughs> what do you think I was gonna say? About I, captioning. Yes, exactly. <laughs> if, you would like to, if you would like to watch uh, uh, the cap see the captions and can use them, um, there's a closed caption button down at the bottom and uh, there's a little up arrow. You can hide them or you can turn them on either way. Um, and at the end of this, we hope to, we unmute everybody and give you an opportunity to thank uh, Lee and Pablo uh, in person. So please stick around for that. And Deborah will then make a couple words about the next, uh, next program after that. So enjoy. Pablo. All right. Thank you all so very much. Um, as, as the weeks go on and we do this, um, I continue to feel more and more grateful um, for the opportunity to share and to talk and to see all your faces. Um, you know, this is a, a wild time in our world. And I think it's, you know, I, I say it week in and week out that I, you know, the, the idea that we can come together as a community, as a, as a culture, as a family and, and talk about literature and art and what in the midst of all this madness that's going on, how can we find our Zen? How can we find our peace? And I'm, I'm just thrilled um, to be connected with FIU, to be connected with the Betsy. It's, you know, it's, it's a family to me. So I'm 
grateful to it. And um, I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to bring people that I love and care about very much. Uh, Lee will hate that I'm saying that because <laughs> he's not a, he's not a he's not a mushy guy. But I love this man. He's a brilliant poet. Uh, we've known each other since uh, well, I, I got I came onto the faculty for Sierra Nevada University, and we've been good buds ever since. Um, I'm just delighted to be here with him to chat. When when we talked a little earlier today, it's like, you know, well, what is the format going to be? You know, I kind of said, look, man, like, you know, like if we're in, in, you know, in the quad on campus, just, you know, shooting the shit and talking about the things that we talk about, um, which is usually gets pretty deep. And so I, I hope that we can sort of replicate that for those who are listening. Uh, this is this is a guy to listen to, and and I always learn a lot from him. So I'm just thrilled to be in conversation. Uh, so Lee, you know, welcome, dude. Good to see you. Really good to see you too, Pablo. And um, I think I'm a little bit emotional and, and mushy. I'll I'll echo back some of the uh, <laughs> the love. Uh, you know, Pablo and I are good friends. So thanks for having me, Pablo. And to the Betsy, to FIU, and John, and Deborah, and Colette, and all the sponsors. I, I appreciate you having me. Um, yeah, man. So I, I want to, I want to like go right into it. Uh, you posted on, on Facebook a few, a few weeks ago, uh, something that, that I, I immediately copied and, and it stuck with me because it was a real, uh, it, it was a, it was, it was a really profound way to look at white privilege. Um, and I know you're working on your memoir now. And so I was hoping, I don't want to get too into it or more than what you want to share. Um, but I, I thought it was a really excellent way to kind of think about it. Um, and I think that it's important that we continue to talk about race and we continue to talk about our places in it and how we, how we as artists dive into the, uh, into the conversations and the multiple layers that are happening in, in our world right now. Um, so I, I, I wonder as much as you want to share, because I, I don't know how public your Facebook phrase is. I don't want to like go into too much detail, but I do, I, I would love for you to start off, like, let's just kick off with that idea of how your experiences have given you a unique perspective on the idea of white privilege. Sure, sure. Well, and just, you know, so you know, and I think, you know, you can ask me anything, but um, for some context, um, I was born in South Korea sometime in late 1970. So I don't know my exact birth date, but I was born in Daejeon and adopted into a white family who at the time were living in San Francisco. And then soon thereafter, we moved to the East Bay in Danville. And so uh, the memoir that I'm writing basically has to do with that, growing up in a white family, but also in my particular experience, finding a sense of home or a sense of peace or calm after a lot of moments or occasions of a complete lack of calm, um, a complete uh, sense of uncertainty and confusion and anger, finding those things without having found birth family, which is the common adoption narrative that is sort of makes people feel good because it is a joyous occasion, that reunion. So uh, the post that I wrote about white privilege was a little bit about that. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people that I know in my family and friends who are white, I think often interpreted that or interpret that as material privilege or access, good jobs, the best schools, um, and a lot of people would say, well, I'm not a judge. I, I don't run a business. What privilege do I have? And that really rung true for me because what I've always felt, and I sensed this growing up, especially when race consciousness became more a part of my uh, thinking, and I would come home really in a lot of pain or hurt or um, distress. And, and I say this, and I wrote in the post, and I would say it 
now and I'll say it in the future, I say this with great love for my family. We're very close. Um, they're loving and supportive. But what it boiled down to for me was that I said that white privilege to me is the privilege of simply not having to care. And I said this in the context also of, of course, there are a lot of white people or people of any color who have economic advantages who see themselves very distanced from the things that we hear about or certainly that get told and retold in the news, but really just insulated from that. But I thought that's, that's what I grew up with. It, it would have been as foreign for my family to talk about Vincent Chin, for example, who's a sort of a galvanizing case in Asian American studies or American studies really when he was killed or, um, you know, Rodney King, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd. So for me, when it was everything and boiling and it was impacting me and, you know, uh, much less the Asian American racism that I've experienced, it would not have been a topic for discussion. It would have just been a, a, anything else, like talking about, you know, the Miami Heat or the Los Angeles Dodgers. Why would we talk about that? And I, I yeah. think that that, that's what I was writing about, basically. No, and I think it's it's so important because there's, it, you know, we're all asking ourselves, or we should anyway, ask ourselves tough questions. Um, not just not just outwardly asking, you know, or not or not outwardly saying this is wrong on the outset, but looking inward too and seeing like where your own ideas of of identity and and how where your place in privilege is and 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 how you're experiencing um those those types uh those those types of of, of questions you know that that come up and I, I that's why it just it really it really stuck with me um i thought it was really brave because you put it out there um and it's something that i i hadn't considered you know i mean it feels it feels like like there's a million different battlefronts happening at once, you know? And like I, as an artist, I mean, I write for young people primarily and, and I, I find it um, incredibly difficult to, I, 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 sometimes I feel like, I don't, I don't know if I have all this energy to, to fight all these fronts, you know? So I'm just, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm wondering how you as a poet, you know, uh, through your lens, through your experiences, how, how are you sort of managing this? Um, because there's ex expectations that come with a voice, right? There's expectations that come with, you know, your, your position, right? Um, and so how are you sort of managing this and, and sort of um, coming to this moment in time and history? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I, 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 th I think in general, I come to these issues both in the moment, you know, June 29th, 2020, but also equally mindful of, uh, of an historical epic moment that this isn't uh, new per se. So I also come to it not accusatory, I come to it knowing what I've done and what I want to continue to try to do and uh, in the way of bettering things for everybody. Um, that involves some listening. That involves some stepping back. It involves uh, setting my ego aside if I'm in a learning mode. Uh, it involves persistence and a lot of faith and some self-care. You know, I, I think one can fry the engine. And so I'm, I'm mindful of that. Uh, of course, the famous Audre Lorde quote about self-preservation is an act of uh, politics. And so I think sort of simultaneously looking what I can do or try in the moment but also knowing there's a history to it and a future to it. And that in this moment, uh, some things are urgent, like a knee on the neck, that's life or death. Yeah. But I know that, you know, 
institutional change is, is a different multifaceted uh, sort of thing that is more complex. So I, tr I try to do what I can where I am to the best of my ability. And I think that that's something anybody can do knowing that we aren't the savior, but we can be part of some sort of moving forward and also not dismissing those who are interested in moving forward. I, you know, we may have talked about this up at um, Sierra Nevada, but what I like to talk about with my students a lot is the danger of mockery in the media. And I'm not throwing the entire media under the bus, but mockery is a very fine line between that and microaggressions and outright racist policies. For example, making fun of an Asian person's name, mm -hmm. right? Or whatever other equivalent it might be, that's all embedded. So for example, if, you know, a media or any other entity wants to degrade a whole swath of people, let's say Latinx people, right? It's a lot easier for them, I think, to function and put in cages or create policies where no one cares because they've already got that frame of mind that, oh, that's very separate and maybe there's some reason they deserve that. So yeah. um, that alongside a lot of walks and self-care, knowing my rhythms and knowing when I can engage and when I have to take a breath. I think self-care is a really important thing too. I mean, it's, it's, it seems, it seems like, well, what do you mean self-care? We should be out there fighting and, 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 you know, um, you know, making, you know, fighting alongside our brothers and sisters, you know, and like really kind of, you know, jumping into it. But, but I think that, yes, that is definitely a necessity and, and has to keep happening. But I think self-care is an important thing that we forget sometimes. Right. It just yeah. feels like, yeah, it just feels like, like we're constantly trying to do like, do, 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 we got to do, we got to go, we got to write, we got to do this, do that. And then, and then, you know, we kind of like crash then. Right. Cause we're not thinking about the yeah. self. The, we're not thinking about how do we care for ourselves too. Yeah. Um, to continue the hard work, to continue the fighting. Yes. And it's, it's a personal subjective thing. It's not the same for everybody, but I would liken self care in this sort of context the same way I might with running a marathon or writing a book. No one sits that I know of, although one of my favorite stories, this is a side tangent, is of Ray Bradbury writing Fahrenheit 451, who rented a typewriter in the basement at UCLA and it cost 10 cents an hour and he you know, really plowed through it. Or Jack Kerouac writing a seven year novel on the road in a span of three weeks, right? So he, in a very rare instance, uh, and he tapes together the paper, which now became the famous on the road scroll. But for the most part, we have to care for ourselves as we write the book. I'm a parent, you're a parent, people have bills, I've got to eat. And it's the same thing, I think, with any other endeavor that is taxing and challenging and meaningful, such as social change, justice, or that book, that uh, it's a part of the process. It doesn't diminish the work that has to be done. And I don't think it should certainly deter, hopefully, somebody from keeping on with the book. But we have to take those moments so we have something internally to keep with the work. Right. No, that's, you're, it's, it's absolutely right. Um, you know, one of the, if, if I can quote one of your poems, you know, again, there's, there's so much of your work that like, that hits, that hits me hard. There's, um, uh, it says, um, I have no idea what priests dream of on Christmas Eve, what prayer a crippled dog might whine before the shotgun. I have no more sense of what is sacred. Um, and that's and that's from from your poem what is sacred and it 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 gave me also you know gives it gave me an opportunity and this is kind of what poetry does isn't it it's sort of like you you can read a poem and it helps you to think about things um, of what you might be feeling and experiencing right uh, we come from two totally different cultures totally different experiences totally different coasts right and we're friends but we have our different experiences and this is what i love about what literature and poetry can do is that it can kind of bring us into these into these thoughts you know so something that you were thinking about when you wrote this 
you know, I read it, I reread it recently and, and I thought, you know, I have no more sense of what is sacred. It feels like, um, like the, like the, like the world is at, at the point of just bursting and, and nothing seems to me, um, to be off limits, out of bounds, you know, like there's no sense, it doesn't feel like there's any sense of decency anymore. It doesn't feel like, like we can't pause to reflect on just being nice to one another or being a de being decent. And I, and I, I probably blame our leadership for that. Um, but as an artist, it, you know, it makes its way into the work. You know what I mean? Like it just, it kind of bleeds into your, into your mindset and you're, and it's almost like you have this internal bleeding of like, well, there's nothing sacred anymore. And so it's, it's like, how do you find that balance of saying, let's give these glimmers of hope. Let's give these glimmers of, of some light. Right. Um, but it's hard. And I, and I just wonder if you could speak on, on, on that particular poem and then also just kind of like on what your idea of, of you know what what is sacred anymore you know what is what 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 do we call off limits you know because it doesn't feel like anything is off limits anymore yeah well you know things are without a doubt um i think at a, maybe an all-time high or certainly tense and i think um social media or other medias that are rooted in that tension to create that sense of, of foreboding doom. I try to step out of it a little bit. Um, you know, for every story, bad story that happens, it's retold and reshared and commented on and retweeted maybe thousands of times or hundreds of times, but it's that one instance that was horrific. Um, so, you know, this might make me sound very old fashioned, but I'm a, I'm a big believer in just talking to people, not in a teach me your history, but just how's it going? You know, there's um, infinite goodness out there and I'll hold on to that till the day I die. But that's also knowing there's also some horrible things going on. So I don't see them as, as opposing, but all part of it. Uh, yeah. The, as far as the writing goes, this is part of the challenge, I think. Um, I think the poetry or any other kind of art, music, uh, painting, singing, but certainly writing can, can really center a person in her, um, in her view on the page as all those things are swirling around her in the world, but also inside the person. That this is part of the challenge of the writer as Toni Morrison famously said, you know, finding the words to say it. It's very difficult to do because we are always swirling in the world, but also internally. So um, this might be a good place. Deborah had asked and, and if maybe I should read something, but That'd I could awesome. maybe read something. And I'm, I'm thinking either um, something about this topic uh, or I have like an adoption poem that I wrote about my birth mother and that kind of trauma or trouble. So um, may maybe I can read the one about this stuff we're talking about now just to, would that be okay? Okay, yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of this book, uh, Scar and Flower was written around 2014, 2015 when Tamir Rice, um, Eric Garner, Michael Brown in Missouri were all killed. And I was having a very hard time writing about it or making sense of it. And so the grammar is a little bit um, not linear and not sequential, but I think you'll get that. So uh, this is called What I Hear When I Hear You in My Head. Is the little whisper the aggregate sorrow, the father's heavy weeping as the son's heavy weeping. What I hear is your artistic response after the massacre, the family of clasped hands, black hands, 
brown hands, a small child whose brother never had a chance, who holds her father's tearful face and says, your eyes are like the moon, is what I hear when I hear you in my head this evening, your laughter like tiny harps. I hear your fatigue as another way to say deprivation. I hear recount, retally. A retaliation is what I hear when I hear you in my head is the grace, the charm, the dead, the boy, the dead boy, the boy who died because of the fear, the forest in the other man's heart, the gun, the heartbreak is the sound I hear when I hear you in my head is how we each sigh with distinction where fatigue meets fire, where we wake and wonder if we all go out to a field tonight, sit by a fire, say the most honest thing you've ever said in your life. Would any dead boy or girl reappear? Not like a mirage, but reappear. Not like a voice in my head, but a body in this room with flesh and bones, with his big smile and orange blossoms in his billowing hair. Good stuff, man. Uh, do, you, do you, um, would you read another one? <laughs> so, yeah, I'd be happy to. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I mean, it's, um, you know, I just think, I think it's nice because we spent, a whole, you know, we've done a couple of these already and they've been great. The com the conversations have been wonderful, but I think that, you know, just kind of taking us into a couple of poems, you know, before I, we yeah. open it up to the Q and A for the, for the general public. Yeah. I think it would be, I think it would just be awesome, Lee. Yeah. So, I'd, I'd be happy to. And, yeah. um, you know, I'll read something a little bit different in subject, but it's sort of similar in tone only in a little bit of heaviness. But I will say that the second half of this book is about how I was trying to cope with the trauma. But I, I think I was going to read one that I wrote about my birth mother and or first mother and just birth mothers or people who have placed children for adoption in general. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so this is called How Music Stays in the Body. Your body is a song called birth or first mother, a miracle that gave birth to another exquisite song. One song raises three boys with a white husband. One song fought an American war overseas. One song leapt from 14 stories high and like a dead bird shattered into the clouds. Most forgot the lyrics to their own bodies or decided to paint abstracts of mountains or moons in the shape of your face. I've been told mothers don't forget the body. I can't remember your face, the shape or story or how you held me the day I was born. So I wrote 1000 poems to survive. I want to sing with you in an open field, a simple room, or a quiet bar. I want to hear your opinions about angels. Truth is, angels drink too. Soju spilled on the halo, white wings sticky with gin, as if any mother could forget the music that left her. You should hear how loudly I sing now I've become a ballad of wild dreams and coping mechanisms. I can breathe now through any fire. I imagine I got this from him or you, my earthly inheritance, your arms, your sigh, your heavy song. I know all the lyrics. I know all the blood. I know why angels howl into the moonlight. Thank you for that. 
Um, I think I think this, that's that was perfect timing. I think we can, uh, John, if we can open it up to to some questions, sure. um, and then and then we'll, Lee will come back and wrap it up. You and I, but I think some questions would be great. Sure, sure, sure. Hear. I mean, there were some questions uh, in the chat about how you started off as as a poet and how that process of finding your voice as a poet kind of how how whether or not it integrated with the process of finding yourself as a as a as an adopted child and as you know and later mm -hmm. as a father and whatnot. yeah um it's a good question i i think my first memories of really loving language or being curious about it was probably when just hearing my mom talk about art. My mom is a painter, so she was always talking about color and shade and nuance and things like that. Um, I had some great teachers in high school. I had a Ms. Barr, my, may she rest in peace, my high school English teacher made us memorize a monologue from Shakespeare. And it was intimidating and a little daunting, but I remember really loving the mystery of that language. Um, music was a, a really large influence for me. Um, I've certainly started reading a lot of poets, um, like Frank O'Hara and some of the New York school I read a lot of. Um, Juan Felipe Herrera was a, uh, an influence, but I was listening to a lot of music. Uh, I was listening to a lot of punk and, um, early rap that had some heat and some lyricism and some anger. And it, it really was jarring and, and made me think that there were avenues for poetry that could uh, hold space for those, those emotions as well. Um, and it certainly, to the second part of that question, it, it definitely uh, was always a little bit ahead of me in terms of my identity and my adoption. I didn't listen to those things looking for it but learning that through that music and that writing, when it came time for me to wonder about myself, I knew that the page held that space for it. I knew that the writing could, could do that. It's, it's really infinite what uh, a book or a poem or something like that can hold. So those early models were extremely influential and helpful for me as I started to write about my own life. Fantastic, Pablo. Do we have time for another another question? Um, yeah, I mean, or I think like keep going. Just yeah, we can. Um, you know, lighten it up a little bit. Um, you know, Lee, t t talk to us about about your um, affinity for collecting soccer jerseys. I think that <laughs> I think you know. It, yeah, I I like what I love about about writers and poets is that we have you know there's the poets we, there's like this serious and they're profound but there's like they're also just cool yeah. like they hang out and they do stuff and we have you know there's there's hobbies and there's quirks yeah. and fun things and you know and Lee and I have had some great conversations about soccer jerseys uh talk, talk about where yeah. that that love came um well thank you Pablo uh so I'm a huge sports fan, uh, and, and soccer really was the sport that I played seriously and competitively through my, uh, at least my uh, younger years. I'll be 50 later this year, so I'm talking about high school, college, and a little bit afterwards. I played soccer all through college and some club soccer afterwards, so whereas now, I couldn't sprint now if I had to. I mean, I would pass <laughs> out in about 10 feet but I love watching it still. So, and I've done some travel. So, you know, you collect things or you pick up little things that are easy to pack. So I've got about- I remember when we were in Jamaica, when we, when we were in Jamaica together, yeah. this is where I learned of this because you were on a mission to find <laughs> a Jamaican football jersey. Yes. It was your mission. And we went to the little towns in, in Fort Orleans and, we, and, uh, and Port Antonio, and we were looking around. And that's, that's what I was like, well, that's, that's interesting. He's like, yeah, man, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta yeah. get this. Yeah. I, I loved it. And I got a Jersey and I, I love to wear it from Jamaica. And um, so soccer and, you know, I won't bore you with all of my strange, uh, you know, hobbies, but I'll tell you one that I love, I have a, a 
got three bird feeders in my front yard, so I like to watch birds too. Yeah, and that's cool. Like you know, I I think that that it's it's goes back to what you were saying, right? Is to to that self care, you know, or that sort of you you get into the work, you get deep, you speak, you write about it, you you struggle with it, you fight through it, um, but then you can go and you can kick back and you can, you know sit back and watch the, the birds, you know, in the bird feeder, because that's something that, that gives you that peace, that Zen. And since we are, this is Zen in the art of writing, right? In the art of poetry, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's not just the writing that gives us the Zen, right? It's the things also that take us away from the writing for a moment to just breathe and think like, you know, I can't wait for the NBA season to start. Like I cannot wait because that's my daughter yelling in the background. See, that is my I zen. I love that. I love that's that. That's my sound. zen. I love you know, that well, sound. I was gonna tell you, like, I, you know, I, I'm outside on the porch, and and there's a there's a window to the to the to the door, you know, and my daughter in in she's my 16 month old in her little Wonder Woman onesie, banging on the door saying Papa, Papa, Papa. But I had so I had I've had to mute it like 10 times. Yeah. Because she keeps running out. And like she, uh, three weeks ago, tested positive for COVID and was very sick. And now she's okay. This is actually the first time that I've actually said this publicly. And she's mm. running around screaming and laughing and raising hell. Mm. And you wanna, that, that's where I find my Zen. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And so like, there's, there's these things that I guess we, we can find outside of our, you know, outside of the work that we're doing to kind of give us this sense of, of calm, of peace, yeah. uh, to take a breath. Yeah, I love the sound. And I know an office and teaching and these readings, of course, my daughter is not, you know, whatever. but as far as those surprises of children laughing or singing, I love it. Uh, it yeah. reminds me of a time Maya Angelou was reading in front of about 10,000 people and a baby in the back was just really crying. And everyone was getting increasingly agitated. And Maya Angelou just sort of stopped the crowd and said something like, you know, let the child sing. And it just mm. recast everything. But, you know, whether it's that or birds or anything else, speaking about the theme, Zen and the art of writing, for me, it's, it's one part to take a break and find that. But also, it's, for me, it's all intertwined. We never know when those things can make its way into a piece of writing. So I try to incorporate all of that. We bring our whole selves to the page, you know. Can I yeah, ask you? And it's, oh. yeah, go ahead, John, sorry, please. You guys ahead. were just at a perfect moment. Um, somebody on the chat had asked about uh, fatherhood and you kind of touched on it, but Lee, I was wondering if you, um, if fatherhood helped you to kind of understand your, uh, get a better sense of yourself and, and how that might have worked for you since you're both kind of talking about fatherhood and Pablo did a great job at that. Um, yeah, it, it definitely did. So my daughter's 14, she'll be 15 very soon. And um, that absolutely made me think a lot more deliberately about my own adoption and so it, yeah, it opened up a lot. Um, I could say a lot more about that probably, but I, I, I believe that's fairly common for parents, not just adoptive parents or people who are parents who are adoptees, but um, it, it absolutely did that for me. Yeah. You're a great dad. And oh, your daughter's, and your daughter's awesome. Thank you, know, you. It's, likewise. You know, it, yeah, man, it's, it's, um, it's, it's such a joy to, to be able to have friends and colleagues and, you know, where you can, that's what I love about, about the, the relationships that, that I have with, with people like you, Lee, is that I, you can, you always learn something. And I think that friendships, that's an important part of, of, of friendships is that you can always, and, and like you said, is just sometimes you just listen and, and you can learn something, you know, and it's this, and I, and I can tell you honestly, like, honestly, I have, I have been struggling because I want to fight every front. I want to, and I, and I feel overwhelmed and exhausted by it, but I want to keep going. But it's this sort of, 
you know, having, hearing you talk about like, well, there's, there's a moment for your, for your own self, you know? Um, and I think that that's an important thing. And then also how can we marry both of those? How can we marry the bird watching, right? With the hard work that it is to write in the world that we're living in today. And I think that that, that piece right there is where we can also find some Zen yeah. is where we can take these two opposing forces, right. And use them into our work. Um, yeah. So I appreciate you for that. Cause I, I, I hadn't thought about it like that. You know, I've often compartmentalized everything. I separate it, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but well, yeah. You know, I, I won't pretend for a minute, you know, to be parent of the week or anything like that, but when it comes to writing and the world and whether it's a pandemic that's killed roughly half a million people globally or, um, you know, the thousand average killed by police in this United States as calculated by the Guardian and whatnot and, and all these killings, um, you know, in your question, how to engage in both so that the, the, uh, so it's not as much compartmentalizing or teetering back and forth as an obligation. Like now I, what do I have to do? Not that you are looking at it this way, but somebody might say, well, what do I have to do about Black Lives Matter? For this, I'm just remembering this now and now I'm learning from you. I'm, I'm reminded of a talk I saw by a woman who was talking about time. And she said, some people try to uh, find meaning through time by the minute saying, well, if I cut out the commercials of my favorite show, I can have eight more minutes to do this. And uh, what she said made a lot of sense to me. What she said was to think about, instead of the moment and the minute, think about the whole context. Is, is it meaningful and something you wanna be doing? And that I understand is a privilege to be able to even say, much less do. But if one does have that, for example, a home, food, then, then I think it's a matter of where a person is and what they can do that they wanna do and trusting that that's gonna be all right and, and they'll keep moving forward, you know, rather than a, a tally or keeping score, but rather, okay, this is all meaningful stuff I wanna be doing. Um, and any work that I'm, think you're probably in a similar situation. Any work or writing, as serious as that is, would never take precedence for one second over my family or my daughter. Yeah. Um, so it's also a matter of having those things clear in a person's mind so that they can engage and disengage accordingly. Yeah, absolutely. Can I ask you one other question um, uh, from, the, from the chat, just to interject, because it kind of, you might be, I don't know whether it fits in here, but. Um, the question is what you're actually reading now. What, what are you doing uh, with, your, with your time in terms of uh, literary connection to the literary world? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm, well, I'm reading a couple of fantastic books that will be out soon that I'm writing blurbs for, but um, books that are out, I'm reading uh, Minor Feelings by Kathy Park Hong. The subtitle is An Asian American Reckoning. Um, the poet Rachel Eliza Griffiths, uh, she has a brand new book called Seeing the Body, which is an incredible book of poems. Um, those, those are the two I'm reading right now. I have a couple of uh, novels I wanna try to get to, but um, those, those are the two I'm, working with mainly right now. I'm usually reading several things. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was another question if we have time, but Pablo. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think that if there's, there's another question, let's, let's, let's go ahead and field it. And then I think we can, you know, we can wrap up. There was another question about how uh, you use nature in your poems and uh, I guess since you, you mentioned bird uh, watching birds and, uh, but you, your poems also referenced birds and nature and uh, flowers and whether you had a kind of perspective on, on the role nature plays on, on you and your identity and your sense of place. Um, another good question. I, you know, I, I can't be the only one 
you know, even if you're raised in a, in a city or in, in close proximity with others, I mean, I just feel most at ease or relaxed or natural in the natural world. That might be obvious, but I, I think these days it, it almost takes an effort, you know, I think it struck me once in another, I was in traveling through some Asian countries and to my knowledge, at least in Latin America and Asia, you rarely see a gym. I think that's an American concept, like the drive-through, which is another thing you don't see very often. You know, uh, so here we associate activity with paying 20 bucks a month and going to the building and driving. Whereas I, you know, I have these memories of seeing women in Beijing or Qingdao in China doing Tai Chi in the park. And they looked like they were maybe 80 years old and it was as natural as anything. And, or places where walking is a lot more um, normal. And that might be because the cities are constructed that way, of course. So to me, it's not an intentional insertion into the poem. Like I need something about nature. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I go down to this, this beach in Southern California every year. I grew up going there and um, I've done a lot of writing there. And so I guess inevitably, if it's that much a part of me, it's, it's gonna manifest in the poems, hopefully in a, in a natural way. Forgive me. It's interesting too, that. Lee, that you say that because you, when you talked about time, you know, and the, you know, and I think like there's, you know, there's like the, um, I forgot her name, the person you referenced, but you know, you take out this, that this woman was taking out the eight minutes so she can have eight more minutes of time. And I think that, that there's a, a concept here, just thinking about the drive-through, thinking about the gym, the 24 hour gym, you know, it's like, it's all about what you can cram in, right? And with nature, nature doesn't prescribe to our, our idea of time, right? It just, there's, there, it, it takes, it does what it will, you know, and there's no, you can't force it into anything. Um, That's right. You could pollute it and then she's just going to get really pissed and just wipe everybody out. But yeah. But really, truly, like, and I think that there's, there's something, um, there's something so real about that, you know, that yeah. you can be out in nature, you can be out on a walk. Um, and, and, and the trees are growing, the leaves are, you know, sprouting their buds and stuff, but they're doing it on their own, on their own yeah. time. Yeah. You know? And I think that's good for the writer, at least for me, because it's humbling. And I think writers yeah. sometimes like to think they're in control. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's that old thing a lot of writers say is that the poems or the stories come to you. And that's a large part of the writing process is just humbling oneself before the page or in nature as it may be. You know? Yeah, you can't, you can't go to a drive through and pick up a tree growing. You know, like, I mean, you know, right. I'm going to pick up this tree growing right now really fast. Like, you know, it's, yeah. it's something that you know, my, my dad has, and my parents have this beautiful poinsettia tree um, that flowers uh, in, in the spring. It's really, really cool. And it, and it got destroyed by a hurricane about 10 years ago. Mm. Um, my father, my father's a veteran of the Bay of Pigs, He's, you know, was a Cuban exile and, you know, was imprisoned. And he knows something about just patience and just waiting. And he, he went and bought uh, a little baby poinsettia um, mm. right after this one was, was, was torn down. He, yeah. he planted it and every day he came out and just watered it yeah. and he would just go. And my mom's like, well, just get a gardener to do it. Yeah. And he was like, I don't want to get a gardener to do it. I want to do it. And he went yeah. every single day, every yeah. single day. And, and now that tree shades the entire um, front yard. Yeah. Um, and that was maybe, maybe 10 years ago. Um, That's yeah, and I just I find that 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 patience and that that connection with 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 nature to be really um, really important and missed, you know. Yeah, and you know, that's a I love that story, and it really this whole conversation could be said for writing, 
the nurturing of that, the humility, the the nurturing of the writing and the revisions and, and yeah. the persistence. And it won't be rushed. The attention. It can't be rushed. Can't be forced. I also I did want to say, and I said this on the side, but I I wanted to say that I, as you know, I'm sending your daughter good wishes. You mentioned. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, she's 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 good, and and I I love her raising hell. To be honest, it was. <laughs> You know, it was, it was tough, but I, I just love her screaming. I'm watching her and my wife is chasing her around <laughs> and I'm trying not to laugh. I feel like, you know, <laughs> and, and my wife is looking at me like, sorry. I'm like, hey, it's all good, you know? So there's there's something yeah. there's something to that, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I want, there's there's a, a saying that, that, that we used to do when we were, when I was hosting the Betsy in live, like live uh, in conversations. Um, we've done so many of these um, and partnered with FIU and the Betsy and it's such a, a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, and the conversations are always great. And this one has been a, a, a special joy. Um, and so if anybody out there is, is uh, you know, up and listening or still has thoughts or questions or something, something that we used to say when we were in person is, just let's keep the conversation going. Um, and I think that in this virtual world that we're living in right now, we can keep the conversation going via social media, you know, reaching out to you if, if you know, on your, on your various uh, channels and talking and, and connecting with the Betsy, connecting with FIU, connecting with me if you like, um, and just continuing the conversation till the day that we can all be together again hopefully somewhere, hopefully at the Betsy, overlooking the ocean with 200 people and listening to you reading some poems. That's, that's, that's Beautiful. my hope, is to have you at the Betsy. I'm inviting him, Deb, so. Beautiful. Is Beautiful. to have you at the Betsy, have FIU there, and have us all celebrating together one day soon, so. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank that you. Was wonderful. Thank you both. So I just wanted to say the only thing Pablo forgot to mention was the paella, which, uh, you know, we love to do a thing called poetry paella, where we, uh, we break bread or eat rice together after, um, after a beautiful reading. But I wanted to give you a, just a personal thank you tonight, Lee. Uh, interesting with this Zoom, I'm looking right at you. Your face is really big in front of mine on my screen. <laughs> I'm saying thank you so much. Uh, the reading was so beautiful and the comments so beautiful. Pablo, you did a great job um, engaging in conversation. So thank you everyone for coming. John may have a, a little goodbye he wants to say, but we hope to see you next week too. Next week is, a, is a, another great, great, yeah. great poet and a great friend of ours, of Lee's and mine, um, um, the wonderful Brian Turner. And, and I encourage you all to look him up, sign up, join in and, and, uh, Right. and um and continue this this wonderful program